the start of the 90s, the world entered a whole new era. The Berlin Wall had fallen, the Cold War was over, Russia was no longer considered a threat and I was born. And James Bond, who essentially was a product of the Cold War, seemed somewhat redundant in this new modern day era. There was a real doubt whether or not Bond should return to the big screen or remain in the past. Even if the filmmakers originally had plans to release Timothy Dalton's third Bond movie in 1991, none of that happened because the studios and producers went through some convoluted financial troubles and lawsuits that resulted in the longest hiatus in the franchise so far. So eventually Dalton bowed down from the part. He was probably tired of waiting because of all these court cases. It was not likely for Bond to ever return. Until June 1994, when a new man stepped in. Expecting someone else? Please do us a favor. Welcome now, Agent 007, Pierce Brosnan. Lots of fans were incredibly pleased when Brosnan was announced to be the fifth James Bond. It seemed long overdue since he was originally given the part back in the mid 80s. At the time, to a lot of people's eyes, he was the only man that could do the part justice. Now I am among those Bond fans who thinks that it's a shame that Timothy Dalton only got to do two Bond movies. The two that he did were fantastic and I bet he would have been so much more respected had he had the chance to do more. I mean, had Roger only done his first two Bond films, I probably wouldn't have fought as much of him. But he certainly got a lot more chances to really make the part his own. And since you could argue that every Bond actor gave their best performance in their third Bond movie, Dalton definitely deserved to at least get a chance to do a third one as well. Anyway, back to Brosnan, everybody's favorite choice by a long shot back in the 90s, and a movie in which he had the task to bring Bond into this new modern post-Cold War world was going to be called Goldeneye. It was named after Fleming's infamous estate on Jamaica where he wrote all the Bond novels. Copy Broccoli was well into his 80s at the time and apart from casting Brosnan into the role, he had now fully handed the mantle to his daughter and stepson, Barbara Broccoli and Michael G. Wilson, who are still at the helm of it all today. The previous five Bond films had all been directed by John Glenn, but now director Martin Campbell from New Zealand was brought in and ultimately held the responsibility to rescue the franchise and make it all work in this modern day setting. From the get-go with the gun barrel, it already feels like we've entered the modern day age of Bond, even though this movie was released over 20 years ago. Goldeneye immediately starts off with a fantastic and thrilling opening. Bond is about to infiltrate the Soviet facility, as the pre-title sequence is taking place during the Cold War. And Bond jumps off a dam in one of the most amazing and memorable stunts of the franchise. I mean, this is one of those signature stunts that will hold up forever. As Bond makes his way into the facility, we get some small glimpses of Brosnan before his face is ultimately revealed. Beg your pardon, forgot to knock.
Although you could argue that Bronson's introduction of him hanging upside down above a guy that is sticking a crap is far from classy, but the shot following right afterwards with the bomb music is just great and Bronson just looks so badass straight away. Whether you're a fan of him or not, Bronson just looks like James Bond and seeing him for the first time in a role here, looks wise, I'm already completely sold that it's James Bond that I'm looking at. He meets up with his fellow agent, 006, Alec Trevelyan, played by Sean Bean, and it's immediately clear that 006 and 7 have some history together. James? For England. For England. The pair showcase that they're both trained and skilled agents as they infiltrate the building to blow it up. But soon they trigger the alarm and the guards show up along with Russian General Uromov. The soundtrack playing over all this is great. I may be controversial here but I love Eric Sarah's unique score that he gave the movie. The industrial version of the Bond theme playing here, the GoldenEye Overture, it just breeds such unique energy into the movie. It's just instantly recognizable to be part of GoldenEye. Eric Serra did the score for the movie Leon as well, which came out a year before this. And watching that, I'm always remembered by GoldenEye, because that movie just feels so similar in atmosphere just because of Sarah's soundtrack. Anyway, despite shooting a lot of the guards down and Bond placing some mines, Bond is soon cornered by Uramov as he has 006 at gunpoint, forcing Bond to surrender. And before Bond even gets the chance to do anything about it, he kills 006. But Bond makes an amusing escape. Wait! You can't win. More of that badass music kicks in as Bond exits the facility and escapes. And one of the things that everybody always points out here is the sudden location switch. Bond goes from here to here. So Bond goes down the dam, makes his way down into a facility, down into a toilet, down some stairs, and he meets up with 006 and they go down another hatch together and down some more stairs, and yet he ends up all the way on top of a mountain and it's suddenly snowing. Oh wait, he does actually go up once here, so I guess that was a really long hatch. Anyway, Bond manages to make a typical Bond escape as he starts chasing down a plane that is conveniently taking off as Bond comes out of the facility and Uramov conveniently orders his guards to stop shooting Bond. Wait, don't shoot him anymore guards, he's right out in the open, we'll never hit him now. So Bond jumps off the runway and free falls right into the plane. It's completely over the top and out there, especially with some CGI effects that seem pretty dated. But I think it's all a great part of bringing Bond back to his glory as he manages to pull up the plane just seconds before crashing as the facility starts to explode. It's a pre-tidal sequence that definitely has a lot of flaws, but man is this an enjoyable opening. We get into the title sequence, and again, you immediately notice that we're watching a more modern day Bond film here. Maurice Binder's classic opening titles of the past, with the silhouette dancing hot chicks, the bright colors, and the excitement of trying to catch a nipple, are definitely classic, but I can't deny that I really love Daniel Kleiman's work on the modern day openings, and Goldeneye is among the best of his work. The end of the Cold War is symbolically portrayed and the hot chicks are still traditionally there. And going with it all is Tina Turner's classic title song. Goldeneye, I found his weakness. Goldeneye, you do what I please. It's one of the greatest title sequences and songs of the series, in my opinion at least. Moving along after the titles, the Cold War is now over as the movie informs us that it's 9 years later. It's now the present day, meaning 1995. For the first time since Fundable, Bond is seen driving the classic Aston Martin DB5. Alongside him is a woman who M has sent out there to evaluate Bond. Meanwhile, a Ferrari joins in sporting Famke Janssen in one of the greatest roles of the series. Ksenia Sergeyevna on the top. On the top? On the top. Yeah, Zenya on the top. Even the character name alone already ranks at the top. 
god I love her. Easily the best femme fatale in the series, insanely hot, twisted and one of the biggest joys to watch in this film. And as a finishing touch, she is Dutch. On the top and Bond start engaging in a friendly race, which is all great fun. The only problem with this scene though is Eric Sarah's score. But didn't I just mention that I love the soundtrack that he gave the movie? Well, yeah, but this song does not fit the scene at all. It seems more suitable for a Mario Kart game. Director Martin Campbell makes a cameo as one of the cyclists here, by the way. It's the evaluation woman that eventually orders Bond to stop the car and Bond follows her orders and of course comes to a stop romantically overlooking Monte Carlo and easily wins her over to get a good evaluation. And the big question everybody is so curious about is, how do I feel about Brasen as Bond? Most people either really like or dislike the guy. I have to say, I really like him as Bond. He definitely doesn't get as deeply invested into the character as Dalton did, but he brought back an important element that has been missing for quite some years now. The fantasy, cool and fun element of what Bond is about. Brasen really brings back that sheer feeling you have as a man of just wanting to be that guy, because he's just so smooth and cool as fuck, you, you wish you were him. For the first time since Connery, I completely buy that Brasen could win that chick over easily. He's a ladies man, which was always a big part of Bond, and besides, I don't think that Bond has looked this smooth since Connery and Goldfinger. I'll talk more about Brasen as I move along. So Bond meets Anatop again at the casino and he beats her. There's some amusing dialogue between them before Brasen gets to do his big introduction. The name's Bond. James Bond. Classic. So Bond gets a hunch that he may have to start shadowing this woman to learn more about her. And boy, do we get to learn about her. <laughs> Zendia, I can't breathe. So where our job had his hat and Jaws had his teeth, Xenia has her thighs and uses sex as a deadly weapon. But if I had a choice, I would pick the on top dad any day. So Xenia kills the Admiral who is then replaced by General Uramov and Bond soon snoops around on their boat, easily takes care of some goons in a badass way and finds the body. Uramov and Xenia manage to succeed with their plan which is to steal a Tiger helicopter, an Apache capable of withstanding any form of electromagnetic radiation. And despite Bond being the only man that knows that this is happening, he is stopped and unable to prevent it. Meanwhile, the movie switches to a Russian space center in a remote place called Severnaya, where we are introduced to our Bond girl, computer programmer Natalia Semyonova, played by Isabella Skorupko, and also the geeky computer hacker Boris Grisenko, played hilariously by Alan Cumming. And he has a great signature phrase that I also like to use, you know, whenever I finish the recapping episode or a good night with my girlfriend. I am invincible! Boris always plays these word games that have to do with his passwords when he's hacking and it becomes a part of the story. Meanwhile, General Uramov and Xenia arrive with their stolen Tiger helicopter and are revealed to be working for the so-called Yanis Syndicate. Xenia kills the entire staff at the control center and gets all turned on during the process. You just gotta love the absolute over the topness of Onatop. So Uruma of Xenia steal the control disc for a space weapon called Goldeneye, a satellite weapon left from the Cold War that can fire a powerful EMP blast to any desired location on Earth. So the pair set the target location on Severnaya itself and escape in their EMP withstanding helicopter. If only the Russians still had this EMP withstanding microchips from Zorin Industries. But yeah, different movie. Natalia is the only staff member that survives as she happened to be on her coffee break and managed to hide. The scene in which the control center is hit by the GoldenEye satellite is just amazing. There are some great explosions and special effects and the scene becomes somewhat emotional as Natalia finds all her friends murdered and the body of her friend Boris is missing. She climbs out of the building on a destroyed satellite disk and has to run off in the cold weather conditions of Siberia. So yeah, not a great day at the office for her. 
Meanwhile, the movie switches to London, where we see that the Secret Service is now located in the real-life new MI6 headquarters at Foxhole Cross. Immediately it is shown that we've reached the 90s, as the movie is constantly reminding us that Bond is now in a world full of strong and independent women, such as the new Moneypenny, played by Samantha Bond. As far as I can remember, James, you've never had me. Hope springs eternal. You know, this sort of behavior could qualify as sexual harassment. Oh, but Moneypenny's updated attitude is just the beginning. We're also introduced here to our new M. Seems your hunch was right, 007. It's too bad the evil queen of numbers wouldn't let you play it. You were saying? No, no, I was just, uh, just, um... Good. Because if I want sarcasm, Mr. Tanner, I'll talk to my children. Thank you very much. A woman. Yes, M is now played by the wonderful Judy Dance, and she's just great. Because I think you're a sexist, misogynist dinosaur. In the past, M had always been the only character that had some sort of authority over 007, and Judy Dance is a great 90s rendition of that, and having her take a stab at him for his sexist ways of the past does really work. I'm sure even the feminists bashing the Bond movies could agree on that one. M assigns Bond to find out who stole the GoldenEye weapon and stop it. But of course, not before visiting good old Q. Morning, Q. Sorry about the leg. Huh. Skiing? Hunting. Desmond Llewellyn was around 80 years old at the time, and I completely understand why they just decided to not update him. You just don't replace good old Desmond. He's been there since the very beginning, and he saw all the actors in the role of Bond so far. And although you can clearly see that he's having more trouble now, as he's reading off the cue cards to remember all the technical lines that he has to say, it's still just a heck of a lot of traditional fun. He equips Bond with an exploding pen and a leather belt that has a repelling cord. And Bond's new gadget-laden car, the Aston Mar Oh, no, wait, the Bond movies of the 90s now feature Bond driving a BMW, which to me is just so... Not Bond. Not to pick on BMW, but come on, our British hero is driving a German car now? In this one he gets a BMW Z3. And at least it's filled with a lot of gadgets, so yeah, something to look forward there. So Bond begins his investigation in St. Petersburg, where he soon meets up with his new contact. Joe Don Baker previously starred in The Living Daylights as American arms dealer Brad Whitaker. This time, he's Bond's ally. Since Felix Leiter has lost his leg in License to Kill, the filmmakers understandably decided not to bring him back with a wooden leg, like in the novels. Instead, now we get CIA agent Jack Wade. And Joe Don Baker is much better as that character. He's really refreshing and is constantly referring to Bond as Jimbo. And our Bond girl Natalia shows that she's another updated woman of the 90s as well. She uses her brains to con her way into using a computer to contact Boris. Now remember, these are the early 90s. It's not like every Russian just had a high-tech computer in his living room that she could use. She gets into contact with her friend Boris and soon meets up with him at some church. Unfortunately for her, it's revealed that he is also part of the Yanis Syndicate and they capture Natalia. And meanwhile, Jack Wade advises Bond to meet up with Russian mobster Valentin Sugovsky, played by Robbie Coltrane. James Bond. Charming, sophisticated secret agent. <laughs> Shaken, but not disturbed. <laughs> Valentin and Bond used to be enemies back in the Cold War, and he walks with a limp that Bond has caused in the past. But now in this new modern world, they are now both forced to adapt and work together. And Coltrane is just great in this. Bond sets up a deal with Sikovsky to get him into contact with Yanis, the big criminal mastermind and main villain that we are still yet to meet. When Bond is relaxing at his hotel, he soon gets a surprising visit. the gun, Commander. That depends on your definition of safe sex. Both Brosnan and Famke Janssen are fantastic in this. It's one of the best fight scenes in the series. They really go all the way with it. Famke Janssen even broke one of her ribs while filming this scene. Although realistically, wouldn't Bond, you know, be able to pinch her between the legs or something to free himself from her thighs? I mean, really, am I the only one who actually thought of that solution? But apart from that, Bond soon overpowers her and has a great line to end it with. No, no, no. No more foreplay. 
So Bond forces Xenia to take him to Yanis, at a Russian graveyard filled with relics of the Cold War, we finally meet our main villain, and it's revealed to be Alec Trevelyan, Agent 006, from the beginning of the movie. Trevelyan is revealed to be a descendant of the Lianz Cossacks, a group who collaborated with the Nazis during the Second World War and were betrayed by the British. And that caused Alec's parents to commit suicide. Alec makes a nice reference to Bond's parents dying in a climate accident too, a first for the series to reference Bond's past as envisioned by Fleming. But him being alive and well does raises a lot of questions though. Why did Alec fake his death in the pre-title sequence? Did he and Arumov set up plans to make Bond believe that he was killed? To do what exactly? Steal the GoldenEye satellite 9 years later after the Cold War was over? Why didn't he just kill Bond then and there? Why set up an elaborate plan if they were trying to kill Bond anyway when he was making his escape? Yeah, looking too deeply into why exactly they planned it in this way can really make your head spin, but that doesn't take away from the villain concept. A former 00 agent, 006 going up against 007, knowing his every move and wanting revenge against the British. It's an inspiring setup. Bond is soon tranquilized and wakes up tied with Natalia in the Tiger helicopter with his program to self-destruct itself with its own missiles. It's a great little sequence that is helped again with a great soundtrack and nice effects before Bond manages to make a narrow escape before impact. He and Natalia are soon arrested by the Russians though and are taken to a military archives to be interrogated by the Minister of Defense. No, that is the Russian Minister of Defense, Dmitry Miskin. Bond and Miskin soon get into an argument, but it is again Natalia who shows to be a great character and stops them from arguing and reveals to the minister that it was in fact Arumov who stole and activated the GoldenEye satellite. Miskin believes her, but soon Arumov shows up and kills Miskin with Bond's gun, framing him in the process. By the way, Arumov is played by Godfrey John and is yet another one in the line of Russian renegade generals coming after General Orlov in Octopussy and Kaskov in The Living Daylights. But I like his paranoid and deranged character. Bond soon takes care of the Russian soldiers and escapes with Natalia into the archives. There are some great scenes of the soldiers chasing them down, they do manage to capture Natalia and Bond uses his rappel belt to escape. What soon follows is one of the highlights to the movie as Arumov kidnaps Natalia to take her to Alec Trevelyan while Bond finds a solution to chase them down. It's a fantastic scene and the only part of the movie where Eric Sarah's score is replaced by the music of composer John Altman. And admittedly in this scene it's much more appropriate than ever to just blaze out the Bond theme in full glory and I much prefer it to what was originally intended for this scene. It's all great fun. Sure, riding a tank destroying half of St. Petersburg is not exactly a stealthy way of espionage, but the scenes are entertaining, action-packed and easily one of the most memorable moments of the movie, heck, even in the whole series. Some Russian people were actually complaining after seeing this movie, thinking that the filmmakers really did destroy lots of parts of St. Petersburg, unaware that a lot of it was replaced by wood and props and that some of it was even filmed at the Pinewood backlot. Arumov manages to escape to Alec Trevelyan's train, where Alec tries to pull one of the tricks his former partner 007 used to pull. Now, time for some unfinished business. No, James. Yes. No, James. Yes, you are going to have sex with me. No, James, I don't want to. Yes, you do. No, I don't. Yes, you do. No, I don't. Yes, you do. Okay, yes. See that? Fifty no's and a yes means yes. Clearly though, only Bond can get away with something like that, but in his defense, it's the 90s now and women have become a bit stronger. Meanwhile, Bond hasn't given up his rescue mission as he places the tank in front of the tunnel, and I just love how Xenia gets completely turned on by the idea that Bond is going to derail the train. She's just great. Bond fires the cannon and sets the train on fire though and soon stands face to face with Alec and Xenia again. He manages to kill Urumov and rescues Natalia, but Alec and Xenia manage to escape, rigging the train with an explosive, with Bond and Natalia left trapped in the train. Natalia in the meantime uses her computer skills again, or well, guessing Boris's passwords, to trace him down and finds out that the base of operation of this group is somewhere in Cuba, just moments before the train explodes. You destroy every vehicle you get into. 
Standard operating procedure. Boys with toys. Hmm. So? Tell me, are there any other standard operating procedures I should be aware of, Commander? And again, I completely buy that a girl like Natalia would have really fallen for him in the way that Brasen portrays Bond. Being a believable with his charms is definitely a strong point that Brasen just simply has. Bond and Natalia travel to Cuba to continue their investigation and Bond is trying his new gadget laden BMW. Soon Jack Wade comes into land to supply Bond and Natalia with a plane for them to scout the area with. And he just takes off with Bond's car. So. That's it? That's the scene the BMW gets? To me introducing the car having all kinds of gadgets and not doing anything with it is just a bit of a shame. Bond may have well have been driving any random car he picked up over here in Cuba, or maybe even a more appropriate Jeep for that matter, because nothing happens with it in this movie anyway. But yeah. So I talked about Brasen being the most convincing with charming the women and bringing back a lot of the fun with the character of Bond, but in this scene however he shows some weakness. Brasen talked about wanting to dig deeper into the character beforehand, and in this scene the script is actually attempting to be emotional of Bond going after his former friend and such, but it just falls completely flat. Italian, listen. How can you act like this? How can you be so cold? That's what keeps me alive. It's like watching an episode of As The World Turns, it's just so melodramatic. I'm not saying it's all Brasen's fault, it's the way it's told and shown too. It just doesn't fit with the rest of the movie. But I can't help but think, had this been Dalton's third Bond movie, he would have done a better job getting in touch with Bond's internal conflicts and emotions. But he's great again with the charming of Natalia while they're in bed later though. So Bond and Natalia continue their search for a supposed satellite dish, but don't find anything. Then they're suddenly shut down and crash in the middle of the jungle. Xenia shows up and one final fight between her and Bond follows. Xenia is as sadistic as ever, there's not a single scene in this film in which she isn't great. Soon Bond manages to kill her by destroying the helicopter which squeezes Xenia to death. It's almost a shame that she's now gone from the movie. So the absolute huge satellite disc is revealed from underwater, which in real life is the largest satellite disc in the world situated somewhere in Puerto Rico. Bond and Natalia infiltrate the place and Bond proceeds to his standard way of infiltrating facilities, by placing mines. Of course Alex sees this coming and easily disables Bond's booby trap with the double O knowledge that he has himself, which quite frankly puts Bond in a helpless position in which he doesn't really have any backup plans up his sleeve. Now we know that Alec wants revenge on the British because of the way his parents died and all, but ultimately his dastardly plan is revealed to be hacking the Bank of England and and wiping out the financial records by attacking London with the GoldenEye satellite and hitting it with the massive EMP blast. It's great that he wants to attack London, but having him digitally rob a bank in the process really isn't necessary and it seems to come out of nowhere that this guy is after money as well. But anyway, it's ultimately Natalia who prevents this from happening by hacking into Boris's system and programming the satellite to self-destruct itself. And Boris ends up picking up Bond's gadget pen and starts clicking it all the time because of a quirk that he has and accidentally sets off the explosive. So Bond saves himself out of this situation because of sheer luck. Bond and Alec end up with a brutal fight at the top floors of the satellite disc and really though this is one of the most violent and best fight scenes in the series that is so overlooked. People are usually referring to the fight between Bond and Red Grant in From Russia With Love as one of the greatest in the series. But this one is absolutely amazing and well choreographed as well. It all ends with a great climax of Bond and Alec juking it out at the very tip of the satellite before Alec meets his demise. For England, James? No. For me. And the only villain who's left in the end is Boris, who dies in a pretty hilarious way. Yes! I am invincible! I 
I wasn't even aware that the frozen Boris was actually a prop until I saw it for real in the Designing Bond exhibition in Rotterdam a couple of years ago. Ultimately the day is saved and Bond and Natalia escape the satellite of course moments before the whole place explodes. The movie ends with the pair romantically making out only to be revealed to be surrounded by marines working with good old Jack Wade. Where were all these guys a couple of minutes ago anyway? For crying out loud they could have given the pair some help. Anyway the movie comes to a close with Bond and Natalia flying off into the sunset and we probably get the worst song to ever be played over the credits in a Bond film. But the less said about that song the better. GoldenEye is an absolute classic. It's the perfect mix of the serious tone combined with some good old over the top Bond fun. And not a lot of Bond films have such a good balance between these two aspects. The film has it all. Well, apart from a scene to showcase the gadget laden car of course. And you can say what you want about Brosnan. I'm completely aware that he plays a rather one dimensional version of Bond that more or less brings elements from the past actors together instead of bringing something unique and new to the character. But he did make this movie work and I feel he brought back so much of the fun and charming side that I think is a part of the fantasy element of what James Bond is all about. I think he's far from the best actor to play Bond, but he was my Bond growing up, so I admit I hold some nostalgia for the guy. The plot is good, most of the soundtrack is very unique, all the action scenes are an absolute blast to watch, the villain is inspiring, the Bond girl is genius, the updating of Bond's world is done terrifically, and the absolute highlight to it all has to be Famke Janssen's Xenia on the top. And I promise you, that's not just because he's Dutch. I didn't like Jeroen Krabbe in The Living Daylights at all. At least Anatop knows how to do a proper Russian accent. Her sadistic, violent and over the top personality make her one of the most memorable Bond villains that the series have ever had. And that definitely contributes to why I hold Goldeneye up so high in my personal list. To me, there wasn't much saving needed of the franchise coming after my favorite Bond film in the series. But there's no way in denying that Martin Campbell directed a Bond movie that successfully brought Bond into the modern era of the 90s. And no, I don't hold any extra sentimental value towards this movie because of the popular GoldenEye 64 video game as I never got to play that in my childhood. Now I consider GoldenEye to be a classic because it simply is what I view to be the Goldfinger of my generation. So, do you enjoy watching my recapping episodes and you just can't wait for the next episode or other content coming up on my channel? Well, support me on Patreon, become part of my community and get access to my latest videos two weeks before the regular viewers get to see it. As well as access to a lot of cool supporter rewards like having a personal Skype call with me. You can find the link in the description and make sure you subscribe to my channel.